special welcome here to um, you all, to St. Joseph's Catholic Church. Uh, this is the uh, crossroads, the seismic story. Uh, first of all, um, I'd just like to uh, uh, welcome some special people. Um, these are our speakers. I'd like to thank um, Greg, Don, Kit and Neville for making a really special effort to be with us today and to share their experiences and their knowledge, knowledge with us today. So thank you, and especially to Kit, I think you've come the furthest. Where have you come from? Um. He's not even sure himself, so <laughs> that's a long, long way away. So thank you very much, and I suppose right at the start of the day, I'd like to thank you, uh, thank you all, and, um, and to welcome you, welcome you all to this place. A bit of context. Today we're meeting here. We're um, talking about seismic risk. We've invited uh, people from, uh, from all walks of life. And people here uh, represent building owners of many different types. And I think the understanding of risk and seismic risk is different for everybody. It's different depending on what kind of uh, building we have and uh, who we represent. So somewhere on that chart up there, you'll see yourself somewhere. Maybe you call it something different, but the values that you hold in terms of your building are different. The commonality is, is that people use our buildings. The common thing is the people. So although we are different, we have commonalities, and that gives us a language by which we can have a conversation. Crossroads, at the crossroads, is about a conversation. There'll be some people talking from the front. There'll also be opportunity for you to talk to the people around you and to ask questions at the end in a panel. So we look forward, and again on behalf of Miyamoto Impact, the Archdiocese of Wellington, and Nick and myself, thank you very much for joining us today. So onwards and upwards. That was almost onwards and downwards, but onwards and upwards. Um, Miyamoto Impact and the Archdiocese of Wellington have had an association now for um, about 12 months, uh, formally, and we've been working together on various seismic assessments in partnership with a, a number of um, engineers around town. So my job, first of all, is to introduce Nick. There's a bit of confusion about his last name, but he's told me that it's um, said Nick... Regos. Regos, not Regos, and not Regos. You guys are all Regos because you're registered, but Nick is Regos. You stay true to your word, Dave, thank you. <laughs> he, he didn't really want me to say that. Over here I have... Um, Long bio about uh, Nick and all of his achievements. I think the most important thing to note is that he's Australian and um, we need to give him a bit of, I don't know, a bit of space. Just give him a bit of space. He's a very energetic person um, and he has managed some very large projects um, both in New Zealand and overseas and last year um, won quite a serious award for uh, his work. He's a very experienced project manager for Miyamoto Impact and for a number of organisations around the world. So we look forward to hearing a little bit of his expertise um, as we start off. He also, like me, um, lives on a lifestyle property, which he calls a life sentence. And uh, on that life sentence, he has a family and a number of horses, and he will talk briefly about those, I'm sure. Um, he's got a diverse background of working with many people, and he's going to be very helpful for us today as we try and contextualise the things that we are that we are working through. Is that okay? Oh, it's fine, though. Yeah, I wasn't too mean. Now, um, my mother is Australian, so I'm the only person in the room, unless you're Australian as well, that's allowed to hassle Nick. And so, with that starting point, I'll ask Nick to introduce me. Thanks, Dave. I'm not sure if this one's working, so I'll, I'll head over here. Um, I'd like to say thank you. I don't really mean it. Um, <clears throat> no, so Dave, Dave and I go back a long time. We've known each other for decades. In fact, I spoke to Dave about two weeks ago for the first time in ever. No. So Dave does also have a background. Um, he calls himself a bit of a, a project generalist, is the term that I've, uh, I've come to call him. He said he's the last pro largest project he's managed has been a very, very uh, interesting travel program with a bunch of students, which he enjoyed dramatically. Uh, I guess the, the, thing, the thing that I've come to, to, to grips with over the last week after knowing Dave is um, I'm not quite sure how to take him, but he is incredibly passionate about the topic that we, we're discussing today 
and has put a lot of effort and time into this um, over the last months, probably two or three months, to get to get us to where we are today. Um, so I just wanted to thank him for that. We are obviously co-hosting today. We aren't trying to make it as serious as the topics are because the topics are very serious, but we're trying to add some levity to the day if we can. Um, and we'll try and get you there in some way, shape or form, holding everyone true to time. So thank you. Now, I'll get there. I was called a technophobe when I walked in earlier today and I'm just trying to prove him correct. <clears throat> Dave, uh, when we spoke, asked me to try and give a bit of a, a run through of my experiences in Christchurch after the earthquake. And I was trying to figure out how to actually do this thing because there's so many experiences over the last two and a half years. How do you actually put them into a very concise format? Uh, so hence I used quite a learned man up here who, who to read that quote, but also said if you've got a problem and he had an hour to configure a problem to provide a solution, he'd spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute figuring out the solution. Uh, interestingly enough, the prop that I wanted to bring was a book. And one of the guys I work with in the office told me a story last week that he, he joined me back from, the over, uh, from overseas from the Middle East some time ago. So when he came back to Christchurch, his parents gave him a book and it was called The Big Quake. And it was published after the September earthquake in 2010. Um, Sorry, the September earthquake 2010 as opposed to the February earthquake 2011. Uh, and it put a lot of things into perspective. I also came back to Christchurch after the supposedly big quake in September for two th for, to, to try and contribute prior to 2011, um, which allowed me to truly try and visualise what I was trying to do, and I didn't understand it at the time. Essentially what had happened is things were quite different to what we thought it was. Uh, so when I was asked by Dave to, to give a run through of experience, I thought I'd put it into something which people may understand, which is called the Tuckman model. Because we're going through a process of continual change. And everything that has happened in Christchurch since day one, I can relate to every element of the Tuckman model. And I think everything that people are going through in Wellington and everyone that people are facing with new information, you go through these, these stages of change with, which, with whatever we are faced with. And the four speakers today, whether they're aware of it or not, I think will understand that they're now very, very skilled practitioners of change management. And if, if I run through this very quickly, um, the forming stage, and this was dedicated to a man called Tuckman who looked at it for team development, but it runs true in all the phases of change that we look at in life. Forming, we're feeling a little bit of anxiety and we're not really sure what's going on, but we, we have a little bit of interest and we're trying to see what's occurring. And I've put these four forms into what I've seen in Christchurch um, since, since I arrived back, and I've been very, I guess, fortunate in one term to be involved with you know, the Central City Plan, the first recovery plan, the insurance program for council, which is the single ins largest insurance claim, the first anchor project, etc., etc. So working with a lot of the key people and seeing a lot of the changing dynamics and seeing all these teams continually form. So <clears throat> forming is a lot of anxiety, wanting to know where to go. Storming and getting to the point where you're starting to say, well, these are the people I'm, I'm, I'm working with and senses of distrust start to form, unease, uh, and also confusion as to where leadership sits, who's trying to take control of a situation because there's, there's a lot of anxiety around because people don't actually know what's happening. And again, relating what's happening to the market, relating to what we'll have topics for discussion later today about percentages of code, around costs for repair to building, about what to do to our building, around what is percentage of code. <clears throat> then takes us on to the next phase of knowing when we then start to actually feel a sense of trust with each other and we start to actually look to the level of professionalism, the experience in others and start to understand that that's what we can rely upon because it's been demonstrated. And then moving into a high performing, performing and then high performing, we're actually achieving what we want to do. So our buildings, if we're putting it into practical sense, are back in the state that we want. Our people and our social effect are feeling calmer and more at ease around what they're doing and life goes back into a normal sense. And it was the only thing I could really think of by putting into this context to run through the experience that I've been through in the last two and a half years because everyone has an experience about being in the middle of an earthquake, about working with individuals that have had 
you know, very traumatic experience or that, or, that have more, or that have moved on from that or others that are still within that space. But literally, this is what everyone will be going through. And I won't, I won't take, um, take the, um, the, the storm here from Dave because I was going to talk about life sentence blocks and he took that away from me. But um, you know, essentially, if we look at what's happened lately in, in Wellington, and I reference back to that September event, and then being in the middle of the city in February when everyone said the big ones happened, I, I, it's a word of caution. And also looking at, we will be going through this cycle continually with the unease and the information that's coming out. And hopefully the four speakers today, um, and I believe they will, because they are all experienced practitioners at change management, will be able to provide a little bit more impetus and, and, and confidence in this. That's probably about all I want to say, Dave. Thank you. I'll hand that over to you. Not bad for an Aussie. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. So what Nick has done is, I suppose, contextualise um, some of how you might be feeling about where you sit. Right at the moment, and it would be remiss if I didn't mention it, uh, we are still going through a series of small aftershocks to do with an event here in Wellington. And it was interesting to see what, how the media treated it. And this was on the front page of the Dominion, or the second page of the Dominion Post last Saturday. They called them the Wellington Quakes for a start, when in fact they're technically being called the Cook Strait Quakes. And I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but those blue and red lines down in Christchurch are the G-force accelerations felt um, in those, or, or measured in various locations. And then you compare that to the effects of the Cook Strait Quakes at the top there, a larger magnitude quake sent it out in Cook Strait, and you can see that the blue and red lines are very small as opposed to the ones in Christchurch. So it's not to scare anyone, but it is to put it into context that what we had and what we've been having are, 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 are incomparable to what was going on in Christchurch. And it's just an interesting thing. This is just one measure, and there's plenty of others, but it's worth noting um, that these events are, are happening now. The other event that's happening in this space is that yesterday the government announced its proposals towards legislation. I'm really pleased by the first line because I think that Neville Brown and all his friends at the council are now going to pay for all of our assessments. It's not quite as I understand it, Neville, that what's actually going to happen. <laughs> um, but um, yesterday it was announced that within five years, territorial authorities are going to have to work through a process of assessment on every building that's not a residence um, or uh, yeah, that's not a residence. It's going to take a long time. Is it even possible? That's interesting. Um, we'll see. And uh, owners will receive the results, and these results will be entered into a national database. That's a very new and interesting thing. That's quite a change, and it will be interesting to see how that works. Following assessments, owners will have 15 years to improve to a minimum of 34% new building standard. We'll talk about that on a number of occasions today, I imagine, and there will be some exemptions available. But if we start from today and imagine that you've done nothing, you supposedly have 20 years. That's the upshot of, of what it says. Um, there's some more information to come. There's a lot of understanding to come, and I imagine all of our speakers will, will speak to this topic at some point, but I want to reference it right at the start so that it's there. It's on the table and will be part of our conversation today.